Hi everyone, welcome back to Get A Brood. So today we're joined by Nick Breeding and we're going to talk about yeast nutrition. There's a lot of different ways people are using yeast. So some people have house yeasts that they grow up themselves and manage and recycle, you know, maybe seven, eight, you know, for, I've heard of more times the yeast being reused. Some people use wet yeast pitches that they buy in. Some people use dried yeast. But um, for me, my advice to my customers is just use a really good quality yeast, you know. But Murphy's do quite a lot of yeast nutrition products. What products should the brewers um, be considering using? And well, yeah, so I think it's a, it's a good question. I and mean, you're right, there's a lot of uh, variability out there and people are doing lots of different things. There are lots of different beer styles. There are lots of different grists and yeast has to cope with all of these and and there are packet yeast dried yeast there are wet yeast there are people who do use yeast one shot and ditch it yeah. pitch and ditch and then there are people who reuse it uh, maybe up to seven or eight times there are people who use it multiple times and so so the conditions in which the yeast can find itself are many many uh, are varied and many the range that we have in murphy's is from a simple zinc salt zinc sulfate which yeah. is either a powder or a solution and you just dose it in to achieve a final concentration in wort of around 0 0.25, 0 0.3 ppm yeah. through to uh, a, through a range of formulations up to quite complex blends of amino acids, vitamins, growth factors, uh, assimilable nitrogen, all designed to enhance the performance of the yeast. So all brewers will know the importance of having a healthy viable yeast. Now the uh, very high quality yeasts you get from Lallemand are designed to uh, work straight out the packet yeah. generally without the need for uh, rehydration or, or for as, uh, just rehydrate them yeah. pitch them into the wort and away they go. Yeah. But some worts will be quite challenging for those yeasts um, in as much that there may be quite a high proportion of cereal adjunct yeah. in the grist, which is diluting the normal growth factors and amino acids that would normally be present for that yeast, to the extent that the yeast might struggle to fully ferment out the wort. Yeah. So this is where yeast nutrition comes into play. You can supplement those deficiencies in the wort by adding a proprietary formulation like Yeast Fit or Nutramix, yeah. and therefore get a, a proper and good fermentation. Um, other instances are if you want to re-pitch, a lot of brewers are re-pitching, they have the ability to skim off yeast and then use that slurry to re-pitch their next brew and their next brew and their next brew and, and so on and so forth. This is all well and good and will work very well for them, but the yeast over time gets a little bit stressed. You do need to refresh it or at least look after its health and keep its viability as high as you can. Yeah. And this is where yeast supplements can come in and play a role like yeast bit and Nutri Nutrimix too. So it's, uh, they are good to consider for, 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 for such brewing. If you're reusing yeast, there's a number of ways that I'm aware of that you can do. Um, so at High Crisen, you can you know, get a slotted spoon and skim off and take a sample and you know, keep it, yes. keep it yes. cool until That's you're right. going to reuse it. Or or if you're not dry hopping, obviously if you're dry hopping you can't use the reuse the yeast. But if you if if you've dropped it out and you're taking the you know the yeast trub off the bottom of the conical and then you store it in the fridge, any tips on how to handle that if you're reusing yeast? Other uh, than yes, I think I think there it, it was worthwhile investing in a microscope and slides and a few uh, basic microbiological um, uh, bits of equipment because you will be able to quite quickly look down the microscope, look at your yeast under low power magnification, stain it, and you will be able to see its viability. You'll be able to see if it's healthy. Yeah. You will be able to spot possibly even a little bit of infection or wild yeast if it's coming along before it really becomes a problem. So being getting into the routine of doing that, looking at your yeast under the microscope is very, very good brewing practice. Um, in terms of the actual practicalities of handling, uh, Cleanliness is next to godliness in the brewery. If you're going to start doing this with yeast, you've got to keep it clean, uh, look after it, use, um, use clean equipment all the time before and after working with beer. This is well known to all brewers, but of course it's uh, sometimes forgotten in the rush of yeah. production. 
so uh, always uh, keep the place clean. And then in terms of yeast storage, if you are taking it off during the high krausen or, or skimming at the end of fermentation or whatever it is, or selecting a slurry, um, you can keep it in uh, pails under a little bit of water, keep it cool, less than six degrees C. Keep okay. it in the hop store, keep it in the cold store, or keep it in the domestic refrigerator. You won't need much, and it'll keep quite happily yeah. in this sort of state of suspended animation until the next time you want to use it. Yeah, and it, it, we have brewers that are growing up their yeast pitches, so they're maybe taking a, you know, a brick of yeast and wanting to grow it up to, to do enough for a few thousand litres, or indeed they're taking a homebrew packet of liquid yeast and growing it up. Is there any particular nutrition that you think they should be adding at that stage? You know, when it first goes on to the stir plate with the Erlen mare and they're they have a little bit of wort or whether you're using spray malt or something to get going. Is there something else that should be added at that stage? Well, I think at that stage, probably also just consider using some zinc, yeah. zinc, zinc uh, sulfate or zinc chloride. Zinc sulfate is the more easy one for yeast to assimilate. So I would recommend using a zinc sulfate yeah. growth factor. And um, you'd mentioned Neutromix and yeast aid. Um, what's the difference between the two of them? Uh, essentially, the difference is quite small. Yeast fit is a powder. It's, it's, it comes as a crystalline powder in a 5 kg box, and you would just add 5 or 6 grams per hectolitre of wort to your cold wort and into the, into the fermenter. Um, it's a very rich mixture. It's got uh, diammonium phosphate and amino acids and, and uh, vitamins in it. Uh, Murphy's Yeast Aid is essentially just a fairly coarse yeast extract, yeah. which has uh, a, a, a weaker solution. So it's, and it also comes as a liquid, so it's easy just to pour it into yeah. the wort. So it's just differences in, in handling, for which would favour particular breweries, the way they like to work, and also the particular yeast styles that they work yeah. with. I don't know if you want to mention this on the camera, but we can add it in. You mentioned with the wet yeast? Yes. you were looking at that? Is that yes. something that you... I think, uh, well, it is. It, uh, it's probably going to not be such good music for the dried yeast people because yeah. uh, that's, uh, that's, it's, it's very nice. The, the, the big advantage of dried yeast is that they're really good. They, they work very well. They're very reliable. They're convenient. You can brew when you want. Uh, and uh, it's just reaching up to the shelf, taking down a packet and, and adding it into the, the, the beer mix. But they're expensive. And they and price as with everything, it only seems to go one way. And for th particularly the pitch and ditch uh, approach to yeast work, it's quite expensive, and it's likely to get more expensive. The uh, um, brewers that use wet yeast systems, that is uh, an, an opportunity for the brewer to get closer to how yeast really works, how you look after it in between pitches in uh, you look after it in cold store how you look after it microbiologically make sure it keeps clean but the big advantage that I see with wet yeast systems is a price we just yeah. talked about price it's much cheaper ultimately the original the initial pitch and to get re top up pitches is expensive but the number of generations you can get from that yeah. yeast is uh, immediately dilutes out that cost to actually become lower than a dried yeast price particularly on a pitch and ditch system um, you can also then uh, get a house yeast. You get a, a, a yeast which is, becomes tailor-made to, to your brewery and your system. Yeast is a living organism, and when it comes into your system first time round, it's, it's having a look around, looking at the wort, looking at your plant, looking at how you treat it, and it'll gradually adapt itself to those conditions and change ever so slightly. So that can become your yeast, and that becomes a unique selling point for your brewery. And uh, like the great names of uh, the British breweries, they've all got yeast that go back many, many years. That have all come. I mean, they're all, it's all Saccharomyces cerevisiae, yeah. but there are subspecies and substrains which get adapted to particular breweries, particular malts, particular uh, water profiles, and particular beer styles. And then that becomes your your yeah. yeast, and uh, that's quite a nice thing for the brewer to get closer to, to get involved with the science of that yeah. and also as part of the story of their particular beer. And the, the, there's an element now where people want to use dry hops during active fermentation for this biotransformation. Um, is it possible to use your house yeast and maintain a house yeast if you're doing that approach? Because obviously if hops are introduced, it's creating issues. So how do you manage that? Is there any way of keeping that yeast running or is it just if you've used it for, to achieve a biotransformation 
i.e. you add your hops um, during active fermentation. You know, is that yeast then not able to be reused or is there a, a protocol that you could use to... Um, I don't have a lot of experience on that. I would imagine from a biological point of view, you can use that yeast again. Yeast is very adaptable and the way the yeast that makes, I always say the yeast that makes your next fermentation, they are the daughters and daughters of the daughters of the yeast that was used in the previous brew. Yeah. So the yeast that's been used in the previous brew to create these biotransformations of late hopping beer, uh, that will have quite a, a sort of thumbprint on it from that particular process. Yeah. When that yeast goes into fresh wort for the next beer, that hasn't got a high hop load yet. Yeah. That it's, so, but the yeast will remember that, but it goes back into its aerobic phase. It then reproduces and the daughter cells will be fr free of that biotransformation process, yeah. or that, that memory. So they will do the initial fermentation as yeast is designed to do. It wants to ferment maltose and maltose triose. Yeah. It wants to reproduce. So it'll do that initial fermentation fine. So I don't think there will be an, it would be an issue with reusing yeast that's been um, exposed to this bio hopping and biotransformation bio yeah. process. Yeah. But you might find that the use of a yeast nutrient helps it yeah. because it may be a bit stressed from the biotransformation process. Yeah. Therefore, using yeast fit or Nutrimix or Murphy Yeasted or one of the other, or even perhaps just a, an ordinary zinc, Product, but I would imagine that in these complex situations that uh, are now d developing in post-fermentation hopping work, the yeast can get quite stressed yeah. and the use of a nutrient will uh, alleviate that stress and il eliminate or significantly reduce problematical yeast behaviour in subsequent brews. This is not something to get caught up with but as a financial cost in terms of Yeast nutrition, the, the total cost of the packaged beer, you know, the, the tin or the bottle that you have, um, it's worth that extra few pounds to give the yeast the, you know, the, the kickstart that it needs yep. and to give the cell walls that extra bit of structure. So Most definitely. It's, yeah. it's, it's uh, decimals of a penny yeah. per pint, really, when you come to this, when you look at all the, extra, the, the, the cost of these process aids. But the benefit, you, the value you get and the benefit you get in high quality uh, fermentations and trouble-free operation is second to none. The last thing brewers want is when they're in the high season really brewing lots of beer. Yeah. It's going out the gate really fast. It's really nice beer. They've worked hard to develop a nice recipe and to create a good process. Um, if all of a sudden your yeast starts to misbehave and you've got delays in that process, so sales are jumping up and down on the brewer's head saying, where's the beer, where's the beer? Yeah. Oh, it's not going to be ready until Friday. Well, that, you know, uh, yeah. your competitors come in and you lose the market share. So uh, why, why suffer that instead of a couple of uh, pounds buying some yeast food to look after your yeast and give a good yeah. performance? Yeah. You would uh, uh, eliminate that. You wouldn't have that. And um, you know, there, there's lots of different options for using that yeast food, but really what we're wanting to do is to ensure that the process runs smoothly and it's yes. the, be the best possible yes. fermentation, strong, yes. healthy fermentation. So is there any telltale factors that brewers should be aware of if their yeast isn't performing that would indicate they need, you know, is there... Definitely, there are. There, it's tailing fermentations is a classic one. Yeah. Uh, fermentations it would normally take three or four days, primary fermentation start taking five or six days. Yeah. Uh, they don't get down to the final gravity in a, in the, in a, in a, in a proper time. Uh, the appearance of the yeast, uh, a good brewer will know what a good yeast head looks like. Yeah. Uh, it looks uh, bright and clean and fresh and there's a good smell. Uh, unhappy yeast, the, the yeast heads will be suppressed and maybe a bit greyish in appearance. So there are visual factors even without the need to use a microscope. But going back to what I said about a microscope, that is a really good investment. I know there are a couple of hundred pounds to get and uh, a few other bits and pieces of kit are required, but it really is uh, a worthwhile investment to make and get some training in how to look at basic yeast microbiology under the microscope and that will tell you when your yeast is. It keeps the viability up and, and a strong and healthy yeast will, will swamp out any infection from wild yeast and uh, again, so yeah, I can't really speak strongly enough about keeping the yeast in a good way because yeah. that really is going to help the brewer. It's his best friend, the yeast. Yeah. A couple of really interesting yeasts have appeared in the market in recent years. The Quebec, if I'm pronouncing that right, or... You know, Quebec. Quebec yeasts, yeah. yes, Norwegian. Um, Farmhouse. Strain, farmhouse yeah. strains, yeah, um, yeah. 
like we we've had a couple of um, members of staff from that part of the world, and they you know would say you know we <laughs> fermenting beers at thirty nine degrees in forty eight hours, and to us that was alien. But now it seems to be readily accepted, and it's a great you know we've a couple of really good strains that we're getting a nice clean flavour profile at those temperatures. And also I'm noticing a lot of our homebrew community customers experimenting with fermenting under pressure and at much higher temperatures. In fact, we have um, been doing some experiments ourselves, you know, fermenting lagers. You give me some tips on how to ferment the lager at a higher pressure. Um, so look, if you're looking at higher temperature under pressure, nutrition needs to be in there is basically what I'm getting yes, at. You know, so. Yes, that most definitely. I think... Uh, a lot of brewers forget that uh, yeast, it's, 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 you know, well, they don't forget it's a living, living organism, but they like to be innovative and change things. And as you say, pressure and temperature, yeah. you change that, the yeast behavior changes every single time. And it can be for the worse. It, it can cause stress to the yeast if it's used to living in a certain way. And then all of a sudden you change its living conditions, it's going to get stressed. Yeah. So by giving it as much assistance as you can, in in a, in the form of yeast nutrition, yeah. uh, then you, you can uh, you know reduce that stress on the yeast and achieve uh, uh, the sort of final product that you want to. Yeah. Um, the, the big guys usually ferment under a back pressure of around about zero point seven uh, bar, a little bit of back pressure on that because they do a lot of CO two recovery and uh, to, to, to capture the CO two that's coming off the fermentation. So to do that, you need to have a back pressure. Uh, to, 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 to collect the CO2 and uh, but you, you'd nevertheless you don't really want to go above that because you can start to suppress the yeast in its fermentation produces quite a lot of um, sulfury and esters and things that you don't want and if you have the too high a pressure that won't uh, that you will you won't allow those to flash off yeah. they go off with the CO2 so you can change the you know the, uh, the, the flavor profile and the aroma profile of the beer by having too high a back pressure uh, higher temperatures, yes, you can get more ester production as well, more aldehyde production, and this can also affect the, the flavour. And it's actually sometimes used by brewers if they have got a, a, a single strain of yeast, but they want to create a different flavour profile. Yeah. And so they can play with temperature mm -hmm. and they can play with uh, yeast pitching amount as well. So you can alter yeah. the concentration of yeast to sugar ratio, and this will also have an effect. There's a wheat beer yeast from Lalamond there that we've used ourselves, and um, if you ferment it, I think it, it's, if you ferment it high, you're pulling out a lot of clove. If you ferment it low, you're getting a lot of banana. You know, so That's it, right. maybe a five, yeah. six degree temperature fluctuation, yeah. you're seeing huge difference yeah. in the finished yeah. flavour of the beer. You yes, know, so. that's right. These are all examples of how, with one yeast, you can create quite a lot of different flavour profiles. Yeah. So, yes. <clears throat> Cool, look, you've heard it from Nick himself. Yeast nutrition is um, a top tip to help improve healthy and um, strong fermentations uh, for very, very little cost. The Murphy products are stocked on the Getter Brewed website. We'd love to hear what your favorite yeast nutrition is. We'd love to hear your experiences and experimenting with yeast, if you can stick them in the comments below. And thanks again, Nick, for joining us. And okay, until, until next time, happy, happy brewing. Happy brewing.